wait a few more we'll roll into the uh, webinar. So um, hang tight for a minute or two, please. All right, I think we're gonna get started. I see a few people uh, trickling in, but uh, we'll kind of start our activities and then we'll go from there. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. Um, the webinar is called Linking Outcomes from COP27 and COP15. My name is Jennifer Hong and I'm a global ambassador with Youth for Nature and I'm currently based in Canada right now. Um, I've been fortunate enough myself to have attended both COP27 and COP15 in a youth capacity, so I'm really excited for today's conversation. And if this is your first time learning or hearing about Youth for Nature, um, we are a by youth for youth global organization that works at the Climate and Nature Nexus. And the focus of our work is on empowering and mobilizing young people and youth in climate nature spaces through capacity building and storytelling activities. As such, one of our goals today um, was to show how that how we bridge the movements between nature and climate. And this webinar is the first in a series of COP related webinars to showcase the work that we've been doing. So before we get started with our uh, session today, I'd also like to remind you um, about a few logistics to support your participation. Um, there are closed captions available uh, for you at the bottom of the screen. So if you scroll to the bottom of the Zoom bar there, um, under more, there should be an option to enable captions. Um, and please remember to uh, keep yourself on mute to ensure that we can hear our panelists. Um, you also have a raise hand function, but I'll invite you to only leave questions in the webinar Q&A function instead. And that way we'll be able to um, triage your questions um, during that period. Um, the event is also being recorded right now, and we also have a graphic recorder joining us today who will also be visually recording what we discuss, um, and hopefully, as long as we have time, we'll be able to take a sneak peek at the end. Um, and again, um, just a reminder to leave your questions in the Q&A uh, box in the, um, the bar below in Zoom, um, and that way we can uh, triage them at the end of the session. So again, the intention of this session is to showcase the experiences of those who attended COP27 and COP15 in the context of Youth for Nature's core values. We'll be unpacking what had happened, uh, some of the negotiations, and also the language that was used uh, within the conventions, um, and hear from our panelists about what this means for the climate nature nexus space moving forward. 
Um, and so before we get started, we're also going to do a very quick activity just to learn more about you. Um, and so I'm going to share a link in the chat um, and also screen share so you can see um, you can see what's going on on the Jamboard. So if everybody can click on this Jamboard link, um, I will then share my screen and we can get our activity started. So hopefully everybody can see this. Okay, perfect. Um, so for this activity, we would love for you to indicate where you're joining us from. Um, so there's already shapes on the map here. Um, and if you wanna copy and paste it or add a new shape to show us where you're coming from, that'd be great. Okay, it's looking like there's a widespread. This is exciting. Okay, I'm going to give it about 30 more seconds. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm just gonna scroll to the next page. If you still wanna catch up and uh, update this, please feel free on your side. So this is gonna be our second question. Um, we're wondering if you've participated in COP15, 27, both or neither, um, and each one has a different icon. So just copy and paste. So the icons are just here on the left. You can copy and paste the one that is relevant to you and pop it onto the map. Give it 30 more seconds. And I know this map is a little bit smaller, so don't worry too much about um, putting it in a totally correct spot.
Okay. And once again, I'm gonna move on to our very last question here, um, but please feel free to update this um, if you're still finishing that up. So this is the last question. Um, what happened at COP, either one, uh, that stuck out or was meaningful to you or of interest during the COPs? And you can use a sticky note here to tell us more about that. Okay, all of our sticky notes are rolling in. Exciting. So I'll read a few of them out loud as they are populated here. So um, I will start, I guess, on the top left as they're rolling in. So we've got some um, discussions and terminology around sustainable use of natural resources at COP15, commitment to limit global, I think we're still finishing that one up, um, the for, to limit global global temperature limitations to 1.5 degrees, the first ever youth and children pavilion at COP27, heated discussions on resource mobilization at COP15 with imperfect translation even in plenaries leading to marginalization of non-English speakers. Um, the fact that developed countries were dominating the discussion on biodiversity and not allowing too much involvement from developing countries. Um, we've got discussion around loss and damage. Someone else mentioned our youth and children pavilion. We've got a sticky note about discussion between youth, IPLCs, and bingos on nature positive. Um, and so, and then nature positive not making it into the GBF, so the global biodiversity framework. Um, we've got a sticky note that says the biggest youth delegation ever at a CBD COP. And the last one here we've got, I see, uh oh, someone said they're, they're disappeared. Uh, if yours disappeared, feel free to write another sticky note and we'll add it to the board. Um, and then the other one here we've got is again, loss and damage financing, adaptation or money carbon markets and regulating networking for other visions or sorry market reg carbon market regulation and great networking for other visions all right so i'm going to give it about 30 more seconds if you have any other sticky notes that you want to leave on the board maybe if yours disappeared you can re-add it i see another one that says intergenerational equity rights-based approach into the framework Yep. 
And there's a lot of people on this board right now. So if you don't see your sticky note, it might just be loading. So don't worry too much about that. Okay. Um, and I see we're still moving them around a little bit, but I think this is great. It's a great start. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And again, everyone still has the link in the chat. So if you do want to go back to this, uh, you're welcome to do that throughout the discussion. Okay. Um, and I might just post it one more time as well for those of us who maybe joined a little bit later. Um, okay, awesome. So thank you so much, everyone, for adding your input into our Jamboard. Um, the responses are going to come in very handy for all of us here to understand who's joining the discussion today. Um, and so now we're going to get into some introductions. Um, as you can see on my screen uh, here, so there are quite a few panelists who are joining us today. Um, and they've all been involved in the COP space in different regions and different ways. So to begin our discussion, I'm just going to invite our panelists uh, to turn on their camera, uh, say hi to everybody, um, and introduce yourselves and also tell us a bit more about what aspect of your work brought you to the COP that you attended. So I'm just gonna go through my screen and I'll start with Stephanie, please. Yes, thank you so much, Jen. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie, but you can call me Steph. I'm originally from Brazil, been based in Europe for the past 11 years. I'm a recent graduate of International Development and uh, the International Cooperation, sorry, and Development uh, at the Sapiens University of Rome. And I went to COP as a Youth for Nature delegate uh, during the two weeks at Sharma Sheikh. Thanks, Steph. Okay, uh, Cesar, over to you. Hello, thanks, Jen. Um... I am Cesar Montes from Mexico, uh, Guadalajara. Uh, I studied biology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And uh, the work I do there is with um, crops, uh, especially cotton, wild relatives, and, and uh, campesinos plantations. Uh, so the thing that brought me to COP was the Cartagena Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and maybe a bit of the Nagoya Protocol to uh, uh, equity and benefit sharing. So, uh, because we, we work with native local seeds and we need to protect those things. And I wanted to know how policy is made in these cases. And I went to the CBD COP 15 at Montreal with Jude Fornay. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, okay. And I see Humphrey on my screen as well. Humphrey, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what brought you to the COP that you attended. Oh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Humphrey Mrema. I am based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in East Africa in particular. I am the chairman of Youth Survival Organization. I am the Youth for Nature Storyteller. I am a Youth for Climate Delegate from Tanzania and also Climate Vulnerable Forum CVF Youth Fellow. I've been working in the climate space for almost four years and among things which inspired me to attend COP27 uh, in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt is to see how we can, um, uh, we can advocate for the loss and damage financial mechanism and also making sure that we have nature-based nature solution as among the critical outcomes uh, in the negotiations which have been going on. And well, I will be presenting the successes and what can be done next as far as youth inclusion and climate action is concerned. For this moment, I thank you. Thank you so much, Humphrey. Okay, um, Casey is next up on my screen. So Casey, do you wanna tell us a bit more about yourself and your role at COP? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good evening uh, from Bhutan. Uh, my name is Karma Singhidrup. Uh, I am known as KC. I work for the Department of Environment and Climate Change under the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources in Bhutan. Uh, I attended the COP in Montreal because uh, just a few months before the COP, I got appointed as the national focal point. So I attended as part of the government delegation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're talking about CBD cops. So on this note, Sweetha, do you wanna go next? 
Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Shweta Sutrabasham. I'm from India, but I'm currently based in New York, and I am the Global South Focal Point for the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Um, uh, I attended COP15 um, as one of the main people organizing youth engagement at the CBD COP. So we were the ones who were raising funds and bringing young people from all over the world to be able to come and attend COP uh, and kind of brought the largest delegation that somebody put on the jam board. So yes, so it, it was a really exciting COP with like a huge youth summit and a lot of uh, key negotiations that we were able to lobby for and key priorities that we were able to push for. So yeah, I'm happy for this webinar to talk more about it. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, we also have Irini joining us today as a panelist. Irini, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Really nice to be here. My name is Irini. I am from Crete, uh, a small island at the south of Greece in Europe, I'm currently based in Vienna in Austria. Um, I went in both COP27 for climate and COP15 for biodiversity this year weird experience it was back to back um i was there as part of the global landscapes forum delegation but also at cop 15 i was all very closely working with the global youth biodiversity network the european chapter especially thank you very glad to be here among friends awesome thank you so much yeah we've got some great representations so this is really really exciting um and thank you again panelists for joining us today and sharing your perspectives and expertise um, I'm very excited to go into our discussion. Um, and just before I do that, again, uh, if you joined a little bit later, feel free to leave questions in our uh, Q&A section in the Zoom. So just reminding everybody about that, especially kind of as we get into discussion and you kind of think of some more questions. Um, so let's get into it. So the first question that I'm going to ask um, is about experiences at COP. So I'm going to start with our global ambassadors, uh, Stephanie, Cesar. Um, you know, cops are really big, right? They're very, very large spaces. They're often really intimidating and very busy. So I'm really curious to know what your experiences were like, Steph, at COP27. And Cesar, what was your experience like at COP15? Thank you, Jen. Um, do you want to go ahead, Cesar? OK, um, so I think for me, it was the first COP I attended in person, I have to say, and I've been quite active in the activist field for the past two, three years, I would say. So it was a great accomplishment. I felt very happy to be there. I'm very grateful for the delegation I went in. I was part of the y friend delegation. We were nine team members on the ground. We were all placed in the same location and we were working together, but the y friend community was much wider as well. So I think despite being a very harmful environment because you're just doing things every day the whole day i think people over socialize overwork under sleep and it's very challenging uh, for people's mental health i would say as well for even keeping a balanced lifestyle food wise sharmanship was not the best especially if you were in the location it was really hard to get um affordable cheap and um let's say healthy options um so I think I went with the best delegation that I could have because I felt really protected and I felt like supported by my team members. However, I felt like despite all of the work that we did beforehand, whatever you do and once you're on the ground never is enough because things change constantly, right? So you're there, you're spending time to prepare all of the events that you're going to go to, people that you're going to meet. But once you're on the ground, it's so hard to actually make these things work because people's agendas and schedules change crazy. Um, I think the amount of noise that we had in the venue as well was really deafening and you just feel like you can never really be in your head because you're following an event but you're kind of in the background hearing like a hundred others so that's quite challenging as well. Um, I felt quite drained I have to say physically and mentally after I returned home. Um, I think another challenge as well was to understand as a youth activist how you can engage in the negotiations and how you can be meaningful and impactful there with your actions. Um, so I think this would be this was one of the great learning curves and it's something that we still need to work on. Um, but yeah, I think that those was were my first impressions for now. Thanks, Steph. Um, Cesar, do you want to add to that? Okay, um, yeah, as Stephanie said, it, 
I, well, I, I wasn't in Egypt. I went to Montreal and it was, I was expecting something smaller in scale. So it was a, an overwhelming experience. There's a lot of things happening at, at the same time, uh, negotiations, side events, so smaller meetings, one-on-one -on -one chats with uh, um, another delegate or interviews. So I think that maybe an advice I could give is, is to have like a clear scope of what you want to achieve and keep focused, but also be open and flexible to learn new things and to bring your perspective into other fields that maybe are not your area of expertise, but uh, that's where you end up working. Um, I For uh, the CBD Cob, I was doing more communications and hearing a lot of uh, side events, uh, keeping track of what we were doing as a team. Uh, I also think that uh, having an outside, uh, someone in the outside, I think in this case was Marina. Uh, it, it was great. It takes a lot of pressure from the people that are on the ground because as Steph said, we are overworked and uh, don't sleep that much. So having someone outside that uh, keeps you, helps keeping you on track, it's wonderful. And also that uh, arranged everything because logistically we didn't have to do much. We just go there and focused on what we were doing. So that's another great thing that I don't see. I don't know if anyone, everyone has that opportunity. Um, and maybe it's different if you go as an individual, but going with an organization, you, you have to be like, you have to have different team members doing different things. So it's important to have communication between you all. And, and I don't know, finally, I think that one thing I feel is that young people feel like more concerned and more like we have a pressure on us to make things right and change, to change things. And maybe it's not the overall feeling that the cops, like uh, older people don't have that concern or they are more focused on other things. So I think that, uh, for instance, things seem a bit slow. So that can be like, it, it adds to the pressure. So you have to chill and practice and that's it. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And I think I'm sure the panelists as well, like, you know, we all come to COP with a lot of um, goals and ambitions. And uh, sometimes it's our work responsibility, or sometimes, you know, us as activists are there, and it is a lot of pressure. So um, I definitely can uh, understand that. So thanks so much for sharing those thoughts. Um, and again, as you mentioned, Steph and Cesar, there's a lot of elements, right, that make up the COPs, like you mentioned, side events, um, meetings, uh, with different stakeholders and then also negotiations as well are always happening between countries, um, you know, at the same time. They're all happening at the very same time. So it is a very large event. Um, I kind of want to uh, switch over. So Casey, you were talking about being the focal point for COP15. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences here and take us into the negotiations room a little bit? Well, thank you so much. Uh, what I would like to do is I would like to start off saying that I belong to this Asia and the Pacific group, which is quite large, diverse, uh, from the least developed to the very developed country. And uh, especially many of the participants from the Asia and the Pacific uh, attend this COP funded by the CBT Secretariat. So in case of Bhutan, uh, this COP15, we were fortunate to have two of us funded by the uh, Secretariat. So now, as you have been there, I think what has what happens is that it starts off with the plenary and then it breaks into working groups and contact groups and friends of the chair. And then we, and then it has so many themes and you know uh, uh, subjects where you would require so many experts, uh, domain experts to be able to participate effectively. So for a member a delegation from a country like Bhutan, when you are alone or when you're too, you are there trying to understand what's going around. And also the, the fact that the meeting never starts on time. And then sometimes it starts, it goes on to very late night. And when your hotel is quite far from where you are, and then my preceding speakers talked about the food habits, you know, and so this really adds up. And then there are some very interesting side events which 
goes on. And then again, uh, you as a government delegate, you just can't be just scientifically correct. You also have, will have to be politically correct. So when these two, I know it's quite, uh, uh, for me, uh, it's, it's quite stressful. So I think I can, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I definitely think after these cops are about what, 10 days long, right? And often they go longer than that. Um, I, I remember seeing negotiators like sleep in the hallways at some point. So um, yeah, it's, it's a tough position to be in, especially with the smaller delegation. So thank you so much for sharing that, Casey. Um, Humphrey, do you want to share your insights on negotiations uh, from COP27? Do you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah, first and foremost, I, I would like to share like um, one of the experience which I came across like two weeks before COP27. I was going through Twitter and I found someone, a very young girl, um, asking for funding to attend COP27. She is a little girl. Actually, I think maybe she's in her primary school, something like that. She was asking for funding to attend COP. And in the comments, people studying, what will you do at COP? What impact will you make? You are just a little girl below 20 years. How can you convince Biden and the United States to stop emission? How can you convince China, Russia, and some other big countries to stop emission? Those comments were really disgusting and also discouraging because uh, anything which is great started small. So we want to see negotiators who at least they are having like that experience from a very younger age. So when I uh, attended COP27, I had four big motives. First is to negotiate because I was in the country's delegation. Second is to attend side events and other small meetings. Third is to network. And fourth is to do demonstration. So I remember during negotiations, there were a lot of things of which as young people, we need to learn. Most of the negotiation rooms, they don't have young people. We keep demanding like we need tables around decision-making. We are so good in protesting. We are so good in, in pushing leaders, but in the real sense, in the negotiation rooms, there are no young people. So how can we learn? How can we impact if we are so good in demanding, but we are, we are hesitant in implementing and making actions? So during negotiations, I, I, I also contributed First, in the establishment of financial mechanism to address loss and damage. And the second, I contributed in making sure that nature-based solution becomes one of the crucial parts of the outcomes of COP27, which for the very first time, COP27 had this kind of achievement. So negotiations, they are so impactful. However, they are complex, they are difficult, they are exhausting because sometimes they even go up to 12 in the night but they are really worthy because the one who is demonstrating, the one who is hosting side event, the impacts of COP27 are in the negotiation rooms. Let's encourage negotiators. Let's take our chances, up, up skill, upscale our skills and making sure that we also one day go into those tables and say something for our planet, for our younger generation and for the people at large. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think you raised a lot of really great points there about being in the negotiation space once again. It's uh, right, like, and also as Casey was saying, right, there's not just the scientific aspect, but there's also the political aspect. Um, and that all really plays a role and can be very uh, exhausting towards the end as well. So towards the end of the negotiations. Um, I'm just going to bounce back to COP15 for a second as well. So, Sweta, I think um, you definitely have a lot of perspectives to um, being from the uh, being the Global South focal point. So, I just wanted to uh, check in with you about that and how you felt the negotiations went. Sure. So, uh, yeah, um, since all of you know, COP15 was not just another COP for the biodiversity space, uh, especially because it was something that was creating the next 10-year framework. 
and it would kind of dictate how we would be able to uh, conserve and sustainably use and access uh, biodiversity uh, for the next 10 years. And that would also set the path for our 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. So with respect to uh, th that space, it was a very cru crucial thing that young people had to be a part of because this was really dictating um, our future pathway for living in harmony with nature. So given as such, we started uh, working towards um, th towards this process from 2018. Uh, we started having consultations with young people asking, uh, a, a lot of our chapters asked young people all over the world uh, and in their countries what they wanted for, what they thought was important to live in harmony with nature. And they had a series of consultations where they created national priorities, which we took into consideration to create global priorities that were lobbied for at the meetings. So that's kind of the process that we took up, a very bottom-up process to figure out what we wanted to put into the post-2020 or youth wanted to see in the post-2020. So um, this all kind of uh, took four years for us because it was supposed to be in 2020 and then it kept getting postponed. And uh, luckily, uh, in several ways, it finally happened uh, in 2022 and it happened in Montreal. So that really opened up the space for civil society engagement uh, for which we were able to create like the first march that we were able to um, use also to push for like the human rights uh, approach within the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. So these were some of the critical sides that helped in influencing the negotiations, the marches, then a lot of the youth went and lobbied their governments at home, but also in the um, during the negotiations themselves. Uh, so, so all this kind of helped, helped us bring together some of the key priorities that young people were pushing for. And I think just to give you a highlight of some of the good things that were quite powerful for young people in the uh, in the framework right now are uh, uh, meaningful youth participation or intergenerational equity, which has now been recognized as, a, uh, as an important enabling condition for the uh, implementation of the entire framework. So youth are going to be well recognized and well, um, part, uh, well engaged in the whole process. Uh, then I think another big uh, success for the whole of civil society was the fact that uh, um, rights were uh, very well recognized within the framework. So a rights-based approach, which recognized both human rights, but also nature rights. And that's something that is uh, the first time. So it's a monumental change in the mindset from like, the colonial conservation practices to fort from fortress conservation towards a space that is opening up much more. And you also see this in the big uh, 30 by 30 target that everybody knows about, uh, where the 30 by 30% 30 is now being recognized, including the rights, um, the lands and the rights of indigenous people and local communities. So all these things are quite a, a, a change in um, in the in the way conservation is being done and the mindsets that people come with at this in the space. So it was a good. It was really nice to see that kind of uh, transition happen towards a more progressive, more um, you know, accommodative, inclusive uh, framework. Um, yeah, so see, these are some of the really good things that happened within the framework. There was also the recognition of uh, the rights of environmental defenders, which is also for the first time being recognized under the CBD, which has never happened before. So their uh, environmental defenders is a key concept that we are is that we should really be proud of that it has been included as young people. Um, but then looking at the overall framework itself, uh, while everybody is kind of happy with the framework, uh, it is also a space that has not been, it's not very strong. So a lot of young people are worried about the fact that it opens up the space for greenwashing. It is opening up the space for a lot of private sector investment, because obviously you all talked about uh, the fact that there was not, there's not enough resources to implement the targets. So therefore it also has a room for a lot of private funding to come in, which also uh, changes the priorities. If, if it's private sector funding, you don't know what the private sector would prioritize in funding within all the 23 targets right now. So yeah, so these are some of the caveats of the space because there are the there's this room for all kinds of interpretation of like new terminologies and uh, people will implement them in different ways, including nature-based solutions, which I hope they start, they actually took into consideration with the safeguards that young people created, like the one which Youth for Nature Gibbon and Youngo did. But um, you know, I mean, it, it all all the stuff that there's actually there, you may not. It, it, these are things that you may may see people take it up or may not. 
because it's not legally binding for them to like take in these safeguards. So how these things are implemented is always a question, but um, at least the fact that the main key elements are in the framework gives young people a very strong chance of actually pushing for the right things. And we are we can actually go back to our governments now and say, okay, you have said you're going to engage young people. This is where you've signed it. Now you have now we are here. Let's engage us. Or you can say that okay, you said you're going to recognize human rights. I see violations happening here please, uh, you know, you can go and lobby them for that. So these kind of things are very good key spaces that we can start influencing it. But yes, it doesn't mean that now that the framework is a great framework, it will be implemented perfectly. And then we'll have all our targets in place. It's going to be, it's going to take a lot of effort from all sectors of civil society to really make the post 2020 uh, get, get achieved in, in, yeah, throughout the next eight years now. So yeah, um, I give it back to Jennifer now. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pieces in there that you mentioned and, um, you know, it makes sense why these conversations take so long and especially with leading to implementation. Um, and the, when you said implementation, that reminded me a lot of COP27 because that was the theme, right, of this year's COP was to, okay, now we have like the rule book, it's finalized and let's try to implement things. Um, so I'm just going to flip back to that very quickly. Um, Casey or Humphrey, maybe you can kind of add to this, but um, what did you feel like was the main discussions that you saw in negotiations or, or um, you know, did you feel we had the, that sticky note earlier talking about language barriers um, and those discussions in the room? Like, did you feel any of that when you were there? Um, and was there a way for you to kind of, um, I guess, adapt to that and work through it for the negotiations? Thank you. Maybe I will start attempting this question. Yes, there are a lot of barriers. The first barrier is language. However, the most spoken language is English, but there are a lot of technical terms. So you can even go through that document and you will be like, what is this? What the hell is this? You know? Yeah, because they are using a lot of technical terms which are um, somehow complicated and difficult for people to understand, of which um, this thing has to be like a process. We need, um, we need to, to get to learn slowly, progressively, because even the experienced the negotiators, they were also like us. So in case you are in the negotiation room and you find like most of the things are quite new to you, don't be discouraged. This is how it is. Those are technical terms of which you can even have your dictionary on your, on your, in, in your cell phone, which you can go through and be sure of what you want to speak before speaking. This is very essential because you might decide something on behalf of your country and it can be not that beneficial. It's, it's just because you have been told to answer, you have been told to, to share your intervention and you are not so sure, you say like, I agree, or oh, I disagree. So before saying that, allow yourself to be neutral. Make sure that you understand everything and then contribute something. These things are harder in the beginning, but as how you are going, there is always light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks so much, Humphrey. Casey, do you want to add anything before we switch back? Uh, thank you. I think uh, I just would like to... Uh, uh, I mean, the support or supplement or uh, my preceding speaker on this also. Uh, for me, what I really uh, I feel or uh, tell myself is that when you go to such meetings, when you have about 196 or 200 odd countries with different levels of uh, culture, tradition, language, just name it. So the text, like for example, if you talk about Kunming, uh, Montreal, uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, it's a compromise text. So we, you, I think if you go in a spirit of compromise, if you go in there saying that, you know, no, this is my position, but at the same time, I have to be, you know, mindful of the other position also. So, you know, I think from my point of view, uh, when people try and water down the sentence or when they try to uh, weaken the sentence, all those kind of things. And also when they don't allow you to bring in new text or new language into the thing, it's frustrating. But uh, what I would say is then, you know, I look at the larger in, uh, outcome. So this, I think uh, this is like, especially when they 
you know, kill the holes in the spacing is appropriate, putting a qualifying like that, you know, it's it's a little bit frustrating, but you know, that's not much you can do. So I, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a large exercise in a uh, bit of compromise and a bit of a, a strategy long game as well, I think in those spaces. Um, so I haven't forgotten about the other panelists, if you're curious, so I'm going to switch over to um, Irini. So um, curious to know, Irini, because you also went to both COPs, um, what were some of the key points that you felt like, you know, were wins from youth and um, maybe some concerns that came up that you noticed in both COPs as well? Um, and, um, you know, I'm curious to hear too, because you came through the Global Landscapes Forum, so it was a bit uh, external to the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And don't worry, I really don't feel forgotten. It's so wonderful to hear the insights of everyone here. Um, and also hearing from people I haven't uh, had the pleasure to meet during the COPs, but also from a few people that I actually had the pleasure to, to meet in person this year, last year. Um, yes, indeed. So I, I went there under the hat of the Global Landscapes Forum. So at COP27, we are not that, you know, involved in the negotiations per se, as we work mostly on the zone where, you know, everyone has their stands and they do their side events, etc. So it's all about networking and yada yada. And um, for, for COP15, we went with a more technical group of people. So it kind of went there with a specific, um, you know, agenda of talking with um, with country delegations and other NGOs on specific targets, et cetera, um, and finding a compromise. Because what is, uh, I loved, I loved what was just said about compromise, because I think this is what must be understood a lot about this document. Like the first thing is that it is a compromise text. It can never be what you want it to be. It can never be as um, how can I as strong as you wish it could be. Uh, hopefully, no, no. Uh, ideally, it can also be as watered down as others would like it to be. So it doesn't hold you know any power. So it is about it is about compromise for sure. And a lot of this compromise actually doesn't happen during COP. Uh, and I think this is true for both conventions it doesn't happen uh, during the official negotiation it happens um in inside discussions where uh, someone brings together two delegates from two different countries or more delegates or um ngos come together to discuss and like come on an agreement among them so they go and have discussions with the um country delegations that they influence more or like they have more connections with so there is a lot of negotiations that happen during cop outside of the official negotiation and i think that this was for me you know a very interesting thing this was my first ever two cops so it was very interesting for me to actually observe observe that um i think what i will also love to share um just to also build upon what others say because i actually my response really has already been said among the the people that have already shared their their insights um what i would love to reiterate is that i would encourage all people especially young people in two things to to hold a very nuanced understanding of what these cops are like i've seen for example for cop 15 um i've seen um uh, communication pieces that call this historical and communication pieces that call this rubbish i think both these ways of talking about it actually take away from the reality of this which that this is a document this is the best that 190 something governments could do um and it's not the end of the world it's as as Swetha said it is a way to to lobby further there are incredible things that managed to be in there like in terms of human rights and rights-based approaches and recognition of indigenous peoples uh things that maybe five six years ago would not be there but the question is would this be implemented because cop 15 has been no, sorry uh the uncbd has been great in coming up with language and coming up with targets, but we haven't seen, you know, concrete implementation from the countries um, in, in the past decade, for example, when we had the Aichi targets. So the question for me here is, is this going to be implemented? It's not about this being good or bad. It's about more, okay, uh, this is what we have. What can we do with that? And also the second thing, I would really encourage young people to understand for this, 
spaces is that it should never be you know the, the end goal of your work and your activism because these are very specific places that are um, really not good for your health that maybe your resources can be spent better elsewhere instead of you seeing your attendance to these places or um, your contribution to this place as the ultimate goal there is incredible work happens in grassroots communities, incredible works that happens in national and local level. Um, and these global shiny spaces are not necessarily the place that change will come from. It's one of the tools we have for sure, because they are curated spaces for dialogue and we cannot abandon them because otherwise we will end up, you know, just having um, agreements that have have no value and uh, we will have nothing you know to take back to our national governments uh, from a global perspective any commitment but at the same time especially seeing for example what's happening with the UNFCCC COPs in the latest years where progressively this becomes like a a show for private sector innovations or like a show for oil companies or like a, a show in general and, and not substantial negotiations um, it's it it's it it really makes me question in regards to like how much value we put there. And again, I'm not saying let's forget about the spaces. I'm saying that next to these spaces, we have so many other tools that are useful. Um, and I think it's important to remember. Thank you, Jen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, those are some really great points, Serene. Thank you for bringing that up. I think a lot of times we see in the space, like especially among youth participants um, as well, is sometimes we get kind of enamored, right, by those big spaces, and it's really exciting, and it, it is a really great opportunity. But um, you know, I felt personally too when I was there, like there's just so much going on that you really have to maintain that focus, or else you can also just easily lose it, right? Um, and and then you kind of question things and then, you know, the 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 health maybe aspect not be there um, either. Um, so definitely, thank you so much. Um, so, so I'm just trying to look at my notes here. So, um, oh, I think we just lost Yuri. <laughs> uh, hopefully she'll come back. Um, so we're curious to know now what elements from COP27 do we think could support COP15 and vice versa? Um, and so maybe I'll go back to Casey uh, and Humphrey for this question. I thought maybe Casey is, is starting. I think Casey can now start. You're welcome. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, for for me, uh, because I have no uh, experience with the uh, COP27 or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, but uh, like, for example, the synergies or the commonalities between these two uh, uh, conventions, as I understand, is like, for example, where there is a Paris Agreement in the uh, climate, uh, there is a so-called post-2020 global biodiversity framework in the CBD. And I think both seem to be now, uh, uh, now climate change seems to be embracing the idea of this nature-based solution. And uh, so from, I think, uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, reporting also is quite uh, similar because uh, not similar, but like I think in the, in the CBD, we have so-called uh, Global biodiversity outlook. This is where it's compiled from individual reports and brought up. And in the climate change, they are they're talking about this uh, global stock take. So I think these are some of the uh, common areas where, uh, from my perspective, from little what I know of this climate change and uh, CBD. So these are some of the areas uh, I think are quite common to each other. And also we uh, there's a growing uh, understanding that. Uh, uh, the uh, climate change is one of the main uh, drivers of uh, biodiversity loss. Uh, like, for example, if you take the deforestation, deforestation releases a lot of greenhouse gases, and at the same time, it has an impact on the, uh, it also has an impact on the carbon sink or the carbon uh, capacity, absorptive capacity. So I think um, uh, both, I think, uh, from my point of view, uh, are not legally binding. So. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for this question. Yeah, before going direct to attempt uh, on the elements of COP15 to COP27 and how they are contributing on each other, I think one of the very important things that, that we are falling short of is that we are addressing climate change more as a problem than more as an opportunity. So since Montreal Protocol in 1987, then we went to Earth Summit where UNFCCC was formed in 1992, then Kyoto Protocol, then Copenhagen Conference, then Paris. All this tried to address climate change as a problem. If we had like um, another eye perspective of addressing climate change as an opportunity, maybe we would be much further than how we are right now. So with this being said, as I said, among the successes that have been attained during COP27 is that for the very first time, the COP27 paper has outlined nature-based so solution as among areas to be addressed. And I want to quote what has been written or what has been articulated in the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan, uh, which is part four of forest. Uh, Article 48 says that encourages parties to consider as appropriate nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches taking into account consideration the UNEA United Nations Environment Assembly for their mitigation and adaptation while ensuring relevant social and environmental safeguards. So you can see that what has been outlined in the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan in one way or another have paved the way to COP15, which happened like a month later in, in, uh, in Canada. So they are working together, but the gap which is currently existing is that we don't have like an integrated meeting or integrated conference between COP for climate change, COP for biodiversity and COP, and COP for desertification to see how we can integrate some of the outcomes. So what has been agreed during COP27 has to be implemented by the parties separately from what has been agreed from COP15. But what we have to do to make it more effective, we need to incorporate the decisions and having like a COP mixture meeting whereby biodiversity champions, climate champions and desertification champions will sit together and see what can be done as a like a synergy. So I think this is among the things that as young people we have also to to see how we can demand our leaders, how we can advise decision makers and do something which will go into prosperity as far as the 2030 UN agenda for sustainable development is concerned. I submit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Humphrey. Um, and you just mentioned as well desertification. So I uh, I find that this one is not as discussed very much, um, you know, especially with the media, we hear a lot about climate COP. Um, first, and then we've got the biodiversity COP and also desertification. Um, they're all three kind of components of, you know, different sides of the same discussion, really. Um, and so it's it's interesting to see kind of where things will go now. Um, and I kind of, I think it touches upon too, like what Irini was saying, um, you know, with like what we see in the media as well, right? So um, something to really think about, especially um, as young people here in the audience to think about where you want to put your energy, right? And, and what you want to focus on um, as well. Um, I'll also invite like Irini, Swita, if you want to add on to that uh, question. So what elements do you think from COP27 and COP15 could support each other um, or any opportunities for synergies and overlaps that you see? Uh, I mean, I think, could I go first and then you kind of continue? Okay, cool. Yeah. I did have a few burning comments. Uh, I definitely love what Casey and Humphrey were talking about. Uh, I completely agree. Casey is right that you need to understand that they are interconnected, the climate and the biodiversity uh, crises. And therefore, you need to actually look at this as a more of a social and ecological crisis and understand that it's not just the consequences of um, climate change that are causing biodiversity loss, it's also the drivers. So this, we have the same drivers. What's driving 
the loss of biodiversity and the climate crisis are same. You know, it's it is our consumption practices, it's our production practices, it's uh, the way we are, you know, really over exploiting our planet and the system that we live in, right? And that's why it's so crucial that we understand that, you know, we don't silo these things and we don't look at them in separate ways just because the UN has different conventions, the way very, very well put by Humphrey, you know, they, they are put in different conventions, but they are kind of tackling the same things. If you actually go down to the ground and see who's implementing all these decisions that are being taken at the global level, it's largely going to be the same environmental ministry or some additional ministry who's coming and helping them out. But it's the same people. And for them, it is a challenge as well. They always say that. Say they, they find it a challenge to uh, reply, uh, you know, report on the SDGs, to report on the you know, on the UNFCCC targets, then the report on the biodiversity targets. So on the ground, it's quite challenging for them. And they need to also figure out a way to better integrate some of these priorities and targets so that they can implement them in a more holistic manner. So that's something that I was really wanting to share with everybody that we need to acknowledge and we need to look at this as a systemic problem, uh, a problem that we need to address in that kind of an approach. And therefore, the whole idea that the um, the IP um, IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform, mentioned that the only way we can really get out of this crisis is not really by tweaking a few things. Uh, okay, we were able to create like a target to have better protected areas. Yay, we've saved the planet. No, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be so much more than that. It's actually a whole of society approach that we need to take. You know, we need everybody to take, uh, take, take control of this. You need your every business to come into place. You need every government to take part. You need everybody in the civil society to really actively engage together. And unless all these sectors come together and we all change, literally change the way we think about the world, it's not going to change. And we have to accept that. But, you know, the, the fact that this is a, that, that's why it's called transformative change, right? It's really transforming the way we think of the world and the way we act in this world. And that is not going to happen uh, from day to day. It is something that is going to take time, but it is something that we have to push for because that's the only way. We cannot feel happy just because we switched off a light in our house or we cannot feel happy just because I lobbied for, you know, whatever I lobbied for at the, at the COP. That's not enough. So anyway, so those are some of my comments on this. Um, to Irene. Thank you, Swetha. It's always a pleasure to hear you getting into this passionate mode of like, it's not about your lights. Uh, no, thank you. These are all beautiful comments and I will try my best to not, um, you know, uh, repeat, but basically build on what you said. Um, I like that Swetha took a more proactive approach because I would like to really get like a more destructive approach on my comment in, in this situation, which I feel that one of the biggest synergies between the two conventions is that none of the two conventions actually names the drivers of all of this. And I think this is an extremely uh, big problem. The fact that we're having discussions about solutions and implementations and policies and what to do without daring to name the drivers of biodiversity loss and climate crisis. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, uh, abstract um, drivers like pollution or something like that. There has been like research after research, including the IPB, uh, IPBES and IPCC. They have both named very strongly the drivers, including the economical system that is dominating um, the world currently, which is based on extractivism, capitalism, and, and ways of production and consumption that cannot be within planetary boundaries. There are sectors that have been recognized again and again by research, like there's 100 companies that have drilled all the oil out of the earth. We do know what the drivers are, and it's it's. I find it... Um, how can I say that in a nice way? I find it almost ridiculous to sit in their room and pretend we're going to find any solution without talking about those things. Or colonialism. I heard quite a few of my uh, co-panelists here talking about colonialism. A lot of the solutions that are being put on the table are nothing more than neo-colonial practices, right? Or the whole idea of protecting a place of uh, the land here and not protecting over there or like... Um, Unsustainable carbon credits, biodiversity credits, all these false solutions that do not make any sense, but they just perpetuate a system that is going to be harmful. They don't even make sense, not from like an activist perspective or a perspective of a person that have quote unquote radical ideas. It doesn't make sense from a scientific perspective to assume that you can protect a, a a little piece of land or like offset your emissions there while you continue to drill oil 
and and consume and and extract and produce the way you do. So I would say that the conventions have managed to be very synergetic synergetic in the fact that they don't name the drivers. Um, and I think that this is a great place to start, that we really need, you know, to start naming the drivers. We have to be persistent in naming the drivers when we are trying to get our words there, when we are advocating about uh, the, eco the social environmental crisis. Um, what I would see as in practice things that um, are arising in both spaces. I think the youth movement is maturing a lot. And I'm saying that with a lot of um, warmth in my heart because I feel, you know, the youth is always put in this place um, within the environmental discussions of like, oh, you're going to be the inspiration or you're going to be the activist. You're going to be this specific thing I want you to be. And in reality, we are talking about young people that are experts in their fields, that they probably work two jobs plus volunteering just to be there. Um, so I think that it's really important to recognize that this is a very mature youth movement that takes into consideration workers' rights, indigenous rights, human rights, something that movements in the past haven't managed to take uh, up so much. And I think that this is crucial because as Swetha and other uh, panelists said, it's about getting the whole civil society involved. It's not about getting someone that is interested in butterflies or someone that loves polar bears or someone that has, I don't know, wants to lead a fully sustainable zero waste life interested in those things. It's about um, uh, the, the, the people, average people, all of us being interested in what basically sustains our own life on earth, right? And I will close with something that I heard this week and I found very interesting. So I come from Europe, right? I don't come from the most privileged part of Europe. Greece is not a very rich country, has never been rich, we are not, the, the north of Europe in, in any sense, both in our modes of production and consumption and living standards. Um, so still though, environmentalism for many years, at least the dominant discourse of environmentalism has remained into this consume less, be like, take your jars, be zero waste, et cetera, et cetera. And a few people understand the policy level um, and all of these things. But there is a very big part of the world, especially, for example, Latin America and Stephanie or others can correct me, that it was always the poor people and the workers that have been leading basically the environmental movements because they have understood how connected this is with their actual life. Like they've seen the territories being taken away, etc. So I really see this synergy between the two spaces. I feel both the climate youth movement and the biodiversity youth movement are very mature. People, the young people are interconnected. You, you already see it on the example, Hugo and Gibbon working together to produce this nature-based solution safeguards um, document together with Youth for Nature. So I think that building upon those movements is, is, is a great synergy. And then the language that has been entered entering these conventions now, the, the Kuning Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework has great language on gender, on indigenous peoples, on, on youth. Can we fight to get that also into the climate space? Like, can, can we learn from the successes of this space and get it on the other space as well? And vice versa, loss and damage, amazing achievement. It was an achievement of the youth movement predominantly, an achievement of the grassroots movements predominantly, and of the governments of the global south that didn't step down in the pressure um, of not wanting this into the document. But then how do you mater materialize about it, right? How do we make sure that this loss and damage finance will not stay in paper? So I feel that these, these are like the a little bit more destructive and not constructive necessarily, but I hope in closing a bit more constructive as well. I, I really um, felt sick after the two cops in terms of like how tiring it was. But at the same time, the fact that I saw such mature movements within them, it really made me super happy on, on how we can actually sit down and, and, and find the synergies together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Irini. Um, and yeah, I, I think <laughs> you mentioned um, maybe not being as constructive, but I think these are fair points that we need to think about, right, when we're going to these spaces and engaging in them um, and and really thinking about what terms are being discussed, right, and what discussions are being had, who's sitting at the table in these meetings. 
um, because it is a big space, but at the same time, accessibility will always be an issue. So um, I think that's a really, those are really great points. Um, Steph, I, I want to kind of turn to you if you want to add anything to what uh, was just mentioned. Yeah, thank you. I think just hearing um, Sweta and Irini talking, so we have all of the solutions, right? And especially, I think everybody that has the power to make something about climate change has already heard about climate change and they know it's an issue. So how do we take all of these great ideas that already exist and they're not from COP27, they're not from CBD COP, they've been there for ages, right? We had the Stockholm like uh, conference like 51 years ago and even before that. So we know we're just like running on the same gears, I guess. So I really, yeah, I think that's the puzzling question because um, youth is on the front line. Um, youth is there as well. And uh, the people that are affected, we are the ones that are kind of raising these questions and these issues, but we don't have the power to implement this. So how to fill in this gap and meaningfully engage because I feel like as they were saying a lot of even young activists they are hustlers I do, I know a lot of people that are parts of not one but two three four youth organizations on the side of like working and studying so we do this out of passion but it's also precarious right like to go to COP as Humphrey was mentioning before people are really on the social media like can somebody please help me because it's not easy to get there um financially wise on top of everything else so I do see a lot of hope when people go to COP. As Rini said, I think you see that there are great movements um, out there and you just see these like-minded peers. They really give you hope to keep going. You're like, okay, there are a lot of people all over the globe that feel and they believe like me, but I, I also kind of be discredited because you're like, okay, especially COP being held in Sharm el Sheikh, which is one of the least sustainable cities um, ever. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, we all get there to talk about climate change, but then we're in this very unsustainable city. And I think a lot of people raise this very valid point of like, should I even go? Do I want to boycott these kind of things? But what I saw was if you're not physically present in those spaces, it's really harder to make your voice be heard as well. Um, and it's very unfair, but unfortunately it is how it is. So I do think that youth movements and other movements shouldn't shine away from these opportunities of being there and having our inputs heard. Um, but yeah, I think now it's the great change, right? This year is the implementation year. Let's see if they follow up on what they've promised and how to make these people that already know about the problem follow up and change something about it. Thanks, Steph. Uh, Cesar, you wanna add anything? Yeah, I just agree with Irene that uh, we need to be more radical, have a more radical acknowledgement of the drivers that are, uh, yeah, uh, in both COPs, you know, the, the, the same problem that affects biodiversity affects uh, climate change. And we need to be more radical about that. Uh, we need to maybe stop being so politically correct in, correct in some aspects. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's it. And working implementation, sorry, that's the main problem. I think that we need to 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 address everyone in in his uh, home town, uh, their country, their city. Implementation, I think, is the most important thing to work on. Awesome! Thanks so much. Um, yeah, and and I think it really reminds me of all of our discussions. It goes back to what Casey said earlier too, right? About like it's a bit of a dance between the policy and the politics um, and the science, right? And then you have all your stakeholders, and certain stakeholders are put in the room to push other stakeholders, right? So there's all of those dynamics that are there as well, um, and everyone has that role to play. Um, as well. So, and uh, I don't know, Casey, if you want to add anything else either about, you know, maybe being a focal point or what we discussed in earlier about having like side conversations during negotiations. But if there's anything else that you think kind of moving forward, we can work on to take things from the negotiation rooms to implementation. If you have any thoughts about that, that'd be great to hear. Uh, sorry, I, I think uh, uh, there are a couple of, uh, from my point of view, challenges. Uh, one is 
to go to these such conferences, get your views heard or get your views incorporated into the document. And then that comes out as a decision. And the next challenge that after that, the most difficult part after that is that come back to your country and then you have a challenge of how do you translate that into your language? How do you translate that into an action? So these are, uh, I think from my perspective, uh, many points presenting speakers have mentioned and I uh, uh, agree with all of them. And uh, this is just one part I just wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, so we are kind of close to our end time. I'm just gonna look at the Q&A and I've noticed um, that a lot of, uh, of our panelists have actually been answering questions uh, through the Q&A already. So I might just go to the one that we have here. Um, so it says, how involved are youth in parts of lobbying and or negotiating, not just for targets and goals, like in the CBD Global Biodiversity Framework, but also implementation plans that get published um, and that they're key for transparent implementation to be different this time? So do any of our panelists want to um, start by answering? Swita, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, essentially, yes. So uh, the way it works is at least uh, within the youth that work in the biodiversity space, we know that it's all about working on the ground. Uh, the work in the COP is really like, you know, like I would say 15, 20% of the work, the rest of it has to happen on the ground, which means we have to work on implementation. Uh, so now some of the strong things about this is that now that we have young people well recognized in the framework, it gives us a, a door, an opening to go to our governments now and say, okay, we want to help with implementation. And what uh, youth did at the end of COP15 was that they did a youth into action implementation conference where uh, each of the national chapters of Gibbon pitched ideas of what kind of action plans they want to create uh, to help with implementation in their own countries. Um, and they all completely agree with all of you. Implementation is key and we cannot just rely on our governments to do it. It's as we all discuss, it's whole of society. So we need to go and join them and say, okay, let's do this together. So that's kind of where the implementation work start, starts. And uh, the way I would say it works is that you... Um, now that you have that open the, a space to go in and start supporting with implementation, in the CBD at least, you have the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans. These are called NDSAPs and they are already present and they have been uh, reporting on these NDSAPs uh, over the last 10 years from the IHE target era. Now, those NDSAPs will continue to stay active. And what they will do is they will update those NDSAPs to include the new targets. Now, that's where we as young people can take part because when they are updating these NBSAPs, you can be there and say, okay, I you are updating these action plans. I want to be involved in how you're updating it. And you can go and kind of lobby and influence it there. That's stage one. Once those updated NBSAPs are ready, you can then again go back to the government and say, okay, you said you want to implement this, this, this at the national level. Young people have the capacity to support you in implementing ABC. So we are going to come and join you in implementation. And most of the governments are more than happy to have extra hands to help them uh, since they are not the ones funding us in, in most of the developing countries and in the South. In the North, the situation is different. But in the South, we have to find other funds from other spaces and then bring those funds in and say, here, we've got some funds. We are ready to implement with you. And this is how we would do it. And that is kind of the process in which you would kind of work with your government to make, make sure they implement at least the things that you can possibly support them in. Now, this is something that we've already done in the past. We've done it before the post-2020 was created. We we helped uh, countries like in my country, in India, in Mexico, we actually worked with the governments to uh, help them in their NBSAPs. We helped them do some evaluations of, you know, different targets that they had set out. And we were like kind of already putting our foot in the door, trying to show them that young people can take uh, support you in this space. And uh, now I think it's going to the next level because uh, at COP, uh, this is another interesting thing that happens at COPS is that you get to meet your national focal points and you get to have a create a relationship with them and you know they get to know you as a person and not somebody who's just another youth who's bugging them so therefore that uh, relationship that you build that friendship really helps you when you go back to your country and then you then you then you know them more as like colleagues and then they are ready to listen to you and help you with your 
projects and and the fact that you want to do them they, they it's they it's more likely you will get support in doing the implementation work so this is at least the process that we use in the cbd space and the youth are, are going to be doing from this year to next year and hopefully to, for the next eight years and really push for implementation thanks so much um does anybody else want to add uh, to what Swetha just mentioned Uh, may I? Yes, go ahead, Casey. I think uh, in Bhutan, uh, where uh, youth have been found very effective is influencing influence their own families first, and then uh, also at the school level. So they have been very, very successful in these areas. And then uh, I think I just wanted to add this too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I noticed that too. I think um, this was something that I remember hearing um, at COP was that we need to keep engaging people because on, on the ground level, because the more that people care and are passionate, that kind of gives you that fuel, right, to, to be um, in these conversations and spaces and start to influence and making change uh, for implementation on the ground. So, so definitely agree with what uh, everyone was saying there. Um, I think we talked a little bit so that you mentioned different countries working together. Um, and sorry, Casey, I'm going to put you back on the spot. Um, do you have any thoughts on like countries working together? And is there, you know, natural alignment with certain partners? Or do you find that COP will kind of give you some space to meet with other countries that you might normally not uh, chat with otherwise? Yeah, I think uh, because what uh, over the years, what I have uh, learned is that now when you go to the, such meetings, uh, the moment you see familiar faces, when, when you open your mouth, I think people take you or accept you more than if you are a stranger in that group. Uh, that's uh, what I have uh, experienced myself. Uh, but uh, I think uh, especially if I talk in terms of the Asia and the Pacific region, Yes, we are so diverse in everything from the least to the most advanced country. We, we all know that uh, if you have a common position and if you can take this to the negotiation table, it most of the time makes its way through. But unfortunately, in our region, it's very difficult because of the language, many things. So uh, I think I'll... Uh, so I think I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe I could quickly add to what Casey was saying. Um, yes, um, most of Asia, it is like that, but there are like coalitions of groups of countries that do work together. One of the most famous ones in Asia, at least I know about, is the ASEAN countries. They do kind of have, they lobby together, but then at the same time, they also have a lot of projects that they're able to do together. It all depends on the institutions that are in place to help with that. With the ASEAN countries, they have the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. And that is kind of like the space where the, the countries can come together and also work on implementation. Implementation. So they have a lot of youth programs and they have a lot of space where young people can take action through that through that center. And that kind of helps like uh, facilitate that uh, space of inter country participation and working in the implementation. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Um, other panelists, did you want to add anything to that question or discussion? I think if I may. Um, I think one thing that was very interesting for me, so I'm a national from Brazil, I've been away for the past 11 years, mostly based in Europe, but it was at COP that I really reconnected a lot with the activism that was going on in Brazil on the ground, and I met a lot of extremely engaged and expert young people, and actually when we were all there together, uh, we created what was something informal, but we actually created this group now that is actually liaising with the government to create this youth uh, climate council in brazil so kind of institutionalizing all of this activism and i think it's also the power of like bringing in the diaspora especially when the country has been through in the case of brazil a traumatic i would say a political transition and now it's actually getting better um hopefully fingers crossed for the next four years so i think these spaces are as Irini said, we need to take it as very nuanced. I think COP is not something that we should forget and do away with, but it shouldn't be the focus 
of our work as well as a part of it is a tool and we should work within that. Um, and I think it's an amplifier as well to what you're already doing and it can become like a stepping stone uh, to go on to greater things. But it's also a moment where you can connect and really where for two weeks at least the whole world is looking at something, at least for the climate, everyone was like, oh, this is happening as well. Um, and I hope it will be more and more like that as well. I hope that CBD COP that will take place in Turkey next year will also get more attention and that people will know that, you know, there isn't only this one framework convention that are more and we need to work together and not see everything so separated and divided, which is something I'm very glad to be with Youth for Nature at because we work at this intersection, right, of the nature and climate nexus as well. So kind of bringing attention to these um, spaces in a connected way. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Steph. And I think that segues us perfectly into our very last question that we have for all of our panelists. Um, and I think we've, we've mainly discussed it quite a bit throughout the discussion, but maybe just to wrap up and kind of conclude the thoughts. Um, you know, I'm curious to know from all of our panelists, given what we've discussed, where do you see youth contributing in these future discussions at COP? Um, you know, we see, we've talked a lot about implementation and talking to your focal points and mobilizing youth through interventions and, um, you know, grassroots organizations and things like that. Um, but, you know, action doesn't stop there. So what do you think is still the missing piece? Like, what else do we still need to keep working on to really, um, I guess, save the planet <laughs> and, and uh, work on these goals? What do we think? Irene, I see a big smile on your face. So I'm gonna start with you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't expect that, uh, but yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, um, let me think for a minute. Um, what is the missing part? Um, I think one is that it is in a way our generations and younger generations and the generations around us, millennials, Gen Z, however we call ourselves these days. Um, it is kind of our responsibility to continue kind of ch challenging the narrative of what it means to be an environmentally interested in the environment, right? Like you don't have to be this perfect activist. You don't have to be this person doing everything right. I think it's, it is in our um, on our hands to continue challenging that. Um, for people like me coming from the global north, coming from Europe, uh, it is in our hands to also understand what spaces are for us and what spaces are not for us and which spaces have to be actually given um, to, to, to people in the front lines, as we like to call them in NGO language and, 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 and buzzword language. But I think a lot of our work has to, to be about decolonizing our own understanding of what the environment is and then finding ways to elevate the people that have to be um, to be uh, heard in, in these spaces more than anyone else. Um, I think a missing narrative is that we also need to break a bit the curse of being seen as a monolith. You know, everyone is like, youth is that, and youth is this, and youth is saying this, and you're like, okay, what youth is that? Um, so I think it's quite important to also break the stereotype of what youth is, because youth, you're continuing to be a young professional when you don't work for a, or you don't volunteer for a youth organization. So like, how can these people that quote unquote graduate from volunteering into working spaces can continue to be connected and like grounded by these organizations that have a little bit more freedom in terms of the narratives they are challenging? Because of course, through your work, you're not always able to be as, um, you know, truthful as you would like to be because you have to respect institutional um, situations, but then, um, how can this be still part of these discussions on, on, on youth? Um, I, as I said before, we still need to, to, to shake the world a lot in terms of like talking about the drivers and like challenging all of these things. Uh, we cannot keep on pretending that we don't know what's the mistake here and we don't know what is happening. Um, and I really, I really am glad to see organizations, for example, like the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, since they are here, that are trying to also demystify this policy world, right? Because it's hard. It's really hard. I, 
I doubt it that even the delegates of countries actually understand all of the text that comes out of those negotiations, like tons and tons of words next to each other. It's really hard. So I'm really like proud, like and, and excited to actually see people, you know, trying to make it simple and comprehensible and and actually making it to a tool you can then take to your national delegations. Um, lastly, yeah, resources. This is what is also missing for, for young people. I think Stephanie really nicely put that out. Sometimes you really want to be involved, but let's face it, in many cases, you first have to pay rent, pay your uh, university tuition, pay your, I don't know, your to leave, to exist, etc. So you cannot spend a lot of your time fighting for your life as you should. So I think it's also worth connecting, you know, with grassroots organizations in your in your area and like unions in your area, et cetera, and seeing also how you bring those people in the environmental space. And I think the youth can actually do that. So I think this will be like what I would see as the next steps of like what youth can do in the next couple of years as we continue to try to make this world a better place for everyone. <laughs> Save the planet. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Um, Humphrey, do you have any thoughts that you want to add? And I just want to mention to you, we're just wrapping up on our time. So if you want to um, quickly let us know what your thoughts are, that'd be awesome. Okay, okay. Thank you so much uh, for this another opportunity. I usually ask people when I get a chance to speak. I usually ask them, I think I can also ask some of you here that if I am born blind, when I have dreams, do I dream audio or video? By just guessing. <laughs> okay, okay. My my point is we can't lead people if we are not informed. We can't lead people if we don't have that vision. The problem we are having is that as young people, we lack solidarity and we lack information. So once climate activists are together, they don't have common sound. They can be saying like, we need solution for NBS. They can be saying like, we need loss and damage financial mechanism, but they don't know th these things in deep on how they can benefit them. So young people need vision. And vision can be developed first when we have enough information, when we have the capacity, and also when we have the commitment. So we need commitment in ourselves. We also need commitment from the leaders, from the leadership, from the decision makers. And we also need ourselves to be informed because for example, you are representing your country as a climate negotiator. You can't go there without knowing what your country needs, what your country demands, what are the priorities of your country. So that means you need first to go to your government and ask them, what do you think we have to go with? Because as young people, because I have seen maybe Greta Thunberg, she is advocating for loss and damage. Okay, and me, loss and damage. Okay, it's, it's something good, but we need to understand priorities that will save our local communities because the impact starts at home. Charity begins at home. So as I'm winding up my remarks, I would like to tell people, and I usually say this, like, if we want to do something, we will be done we will absolutely be done. So this is our time. And if not now, then when? If not us, then who? I rest my case. Thank you. Casey, did you want to add to wrap up? Uh, thank you so much. I want to be a witness for now, for this part. Uh, what we believe and what I strongly believe is that for any important thing, it starts with the information. It's a collective information. And that information becomes a knowledge. And using this collective information and knowledge, we have come up with the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework. Now that is a knowledge, but it's not your knowledge. It's borrowed. So the borrowed knowledge if uh, knowledge is bought, anything that is borrowed will not stay with you. We, we, you have to give it back at some stage. But how do you make it your own knowledge is you practice. It's not important whether you understand that 
uh, if whether you need to implement the whole uh, Kunming Bajus framework, but you take some element, if you practice, show an example, that's what will count in the future. And uh, what I want to say at this juncture is, again, in terms of what is miss missing is, from my perspective, uh, we have to ask questions to ourselves, whether you are a youth or whether you are a senior citizen or whether you are a mid-age, why are you doing this? Are you doing it because you get paid? Is it because is it your passion? Or do you as a human being, do you feel a sense of responsibility? What is that? What is triggering you to do this? So these are some of the questions I think to me uh, will ask. One last thing I wanted to say is that we have to, what we have to again ask to ourselves is that we know that many institution, institutions and human beings, thousands of them have come and gone. But what is important is what you have to ask yourself is how do you want to be remembered when you are long gone? So I just want to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, Cesar, you want to go next? Yep, there. Thanks, Jen. Um, so for the missing piece, I, I don't think there's like really a missing piece. I think the bases are already there and we just need to keep pushing forward. I think Yuven has done an amazing job uh, starting to open spaces for all the youth people. Um, we need to keep pushing for intergenerational equity as well as other types of equity. And it, it's not that we need to make the decisions, but we do need to be in the room and we need to be in the discussions and we need to have our voices heard. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Steph? Yeah, thank you. I think I'm halfway in between. I think I agree with Cesar. I think all of the pieces are already there. We kind of have a map of moving forward, but I do think that one uh, thing that is really missing is funding. I think youth is great. It's doing amazing work out there. Just give us the money um, and we'll keep doing more and better, you know, just scaling up what we do. Um, and I think, imagine we have all of this potential and most of us work uh, in a volunteer position. So imagine all of us being able to continue within this, but full-time in paid positions and then being able to live decent and life. So I think give us the money and we'll continue doing that, but also give us meaningful opportunities for engagement. I think the tokenization of youth, you know, that, that you just ask on a panel and you're like, oh yeah, I tick that box, I have youth there. No, it needs to be something institutionalized. It needs to be there. There needs to be this kind of systems change of thinking because intergenerational equity is also, you know, giving us a meaningful seat at the table. And I think it would be interesting to, especially in this youth fields, but not only, not only talk about decarbonization, but also talk about perhaps dematerialization or kind of really rethinking the ways we are engaging with, I don't know, our daily lives and how we consume and what we do, because that's a great part of as well of the drivers, right? Of the loss of biodiversity and pollution and all of that. So I think there needs to be a kind of amplification of the messages and kind of bridging them and bringing them together. Awesome, thanks so much, Steph. Um, and Suitha, over to you for the final 30 seconds. <laughs> I usually like the I like the sentence and that's something that all of you have been talking about maybe reminded me of it is that uh, we all need to acknowledge that the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis really did not start with the industrial revolution it actually started with the uh, casteism sexism racism it started with patriarchy it started with colonialism so uh, unless we go and touch all those root causes that Irene has so beautifully told us again and again we go and hammer at those spaces we are not going to change anything so let's think about that let's really focus on how we want to change the world and the world we want to live in and definitely, I think my personal requ request to all young people is to not over glamif glamify your the cops. It is good to have young people at the cops. It is good to have young people who know their shit to be at the cop. But if you are, if you think you are going to be an activist and want to influence it, you can do that. But I think there are much better ways that you can actually work on the ground. 
uh, you can do so much more with that same amount of money that you would need to go to the cop you could do so much more with just that money to implement stuff on the ground and i love what uh, stephanie said is just give us the money you know that's that's the best way to end, end this webinar and we will change stuff <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, I think those are great points, right? Like having the information, having the resources, having your motive there, right? Really reflecting on what you are doing and what your purpose is, as Casey mentioned, right? And then bringing that all together and uh, choosing where you put your energy um, and, uh, and, and influencing what you can, right, in your local communities um, as well. Um, so thank you so much for that perspective. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning of this session that we have a graphic recorder with us today as well. So Manuel is here, um, and I think he's been busy <laughs> probably drawing what we've been um, so crazily discussing. Um, and so I'm really excited to see uh, what uh, you have in store for us. So Manuel, if you want to share your screen, that'd be amazing. Yes. One second. It was a lot of input, so I still need a couple of minutes to work on it, but I can show you a preliminary draft. I hope you can see something. Wow, that's so cool. Wow, that's amazing. I love the humbleness of uh, it's I, I still need to work on this. Like, okay. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is super neat I think our, our dialogue was super strong today so I'm I'm very very amazed that you were able to do this Manuel in the short time that we had <laughs> yeah I did the best I could <laughs> yeah no it's amazing um, okay. okay I'm sure that Jen will share these um these slides with you as soon as they're done Okay. Thank you so much. I'm stop sharing. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's amazing. Great work. Thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, like panelists, for sharing your time with us and your perspectives, um, and for those um, who on the Youth for Nature side of things have helped to coordinate um, the back end of this Zoom so that it went very smoothly. So thanks so much, Vinamra, Leonard, Rachel. Um, and uh, for those of you who have joined us today, thank you so much for being here to listen to these perspectives um, and thinking more about your role in this uh, landscape. Um, and again, as we mentioned, we have a lot of really cool materials to share, uh, including Manal's work, but also the rest of the Youth for Nature work. Um, and we have more webinars coming up related to COP. So please uh, feel free to follow us on social media and uh, you'll get all of our uh, information that way. So I'll also share that in the chat, but thank you again very much everyone for joining today. Bye, thank you everybody. Thank you, thank everyone. you. bye. Bye. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, the, yeah. the, the graphic was very interesting. Would we, would we have access to that later? Yes, absolutely. We can uh, email it to you once we uh, once it's finished. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I think the rest of us are just going to hang out. So feel free to leave whenever you need to leave. Is or chat. Still being web streamed to other people? No. Which one? This webinar? No, now. <laughs>